Hello, I'm Rhonda Stevenson and welcome to Space Matters. Today, we will be visiting with Grant Anderson of Paragon Space Development Corporation, and he's gonna give us some insight to uh, habitats and the activities of Paragon and, and how they are um, a crucial company uh, in the industrial ecosystem for space development. Hello, I'm Rhonda Stevenson, and I'm here with Grant Anderson of Paragon Space Development Corporation. Hi, Grant. How are you doing? Hi, Rhonda. Great to see you again. I'm doing. I'm doing well. I just came off a two-week vacation a week ago, so that's. I'm still in the afterglow of that. Wonderful. How do you vacation? How do I vacation? Uh, not. Not. I'm not normal that way. I actually biked 540 miles, roughly, uh, from Nashville to Baton Rouge. As a matter of fact, I bicycled by myself. I do these things usually solo, unsupported, although this time it was nice. My wife was with me and the country was opening up and got to hit the first live show ever at the at the uh, Grand Old Opry in over a year and saw Lady A. It was it was uh, and New Orleans was a blast. So it, it was uh, it was fun. It's great to be vaccinated. Yeah, it is great to be vaccinated. All right. Well, can you tell us a little bit about Paragon Space Development Corporation? I have a whole bunch of questions but I'd like for you to give us an overview first. Okay, so Paragon is a 28 year old now organization. We, we turned 28 in May of this year. So we were founded in 1993. Uh, we do life support in extreme environments. So that space being the ultimate extreme environment, that's uh, obviously we do a lot of space work, but we also do terrestrial stuff having to do mainly with uh, thermal and, and uh, living in extremely bad environments. If you know, we're not interested in let's say like normal scuba gear, but if you wanna go dive in say jet fuel, we can help you do that. Uh, and, uh, and, and as many of, uh, of your listeners may know, we hold the record for the highest skydive in the world, having broken Red Bull slash Felix Baumgartner's record that was set in 2012. So in 2014, Alan Eustace uh, skydived from 135,890 feet. Um, and uh, so those are other extreme environments. Obviously, you need a spacesuit to, to live at 135,000 feet also. So what kind of, so I'm assuming that, that the kind of work that you do, um, that Paragon does is to provide the International Space Station with services for habitation, is that correct? Yes, as a matter of fact, we have a uh, something called a brine processor up there right now. It was, uh, it's the 10th, uh, demonstration experiment on space station for essentially future technology to take us to Mars. And one of the goals that NASA set out is to have a 98% uh, closure of the water loop. And what the BPA is, what is known as the brine processor assembly, uh, dewaters the urine uh, to down to its salts really and takes out 98% of the water. Um, and, and, and the reason it's called the brine process assembly is right now NASA does a two-stage process. They, they use a vapor cascade distiller to take out a fair amount of the water and then they give that to us and we take out the rest of the water. Um, so that's up now uh, being tested. It's a, it's a one-year flight experiment um, and then actually it's designed to stay on space station as long as space station is still flying. So it, we expect it to be there for a little while. Um, other things, of course, are, you know, this uh, space station is not the only space station or it's not going to be soon here. Uh, we work many of the commercial space flight programs, the commercial space station programs, many of I can't name because of non-disclosure agreements. Um, and we were happy to announce two or three weeks ago that we are also on the HALO program, which is the small space station to go around the moon as part of the Artemis mission. It's the way station between the Orion vehicle and the human lander system that's going to land on the moon. Um, and we're doing the life support system for that vehicle also. So can you please uh, go into a little more detail about what a life support system is? I think that there's the regular assumptions of oxygen and, and, and water uh, services, but what else is involved in that? Well, yeah, uh, that's that's really um, a good question because a lot of people um, don't quite understand life support. And I will also say that life support is very often a um, it's different, defined differently, say, by the Russians, or the Indians, or the Chinese and, and whatever else. But in America, in general, life support systems are six elements. 
One of them is the human accommodations themselves, the, what we call the, the human, um, uh, uh, the life support, uh, sorry, I'm messing up with the name, but anyway, it, it's the stuff like the, the clothing, um, the uh, human accommodations, um, the uh, uh, hygiene, you know, the washing and all that type of stuff. Um, that's one thing. The other one is now water management, which is slightly different. So providing drinkable water, recycling water, recovering water out of the humidity from the air, the water that's used in washing uh, and the, what we call the gray water and filtering that. Then there's the air management. Um, and that has to do with not only the constituents of air, so not only just the oxygen you breathe and making sure you scrub out the things we put out, the carbon dioxide and stuff, but also maintaining the pressure itself. Some spacecraft are at 14.7 uh, uh, PSI, which is the uh, you know nominal uh, sea level atmospheric pressure. Some are at 10, some are at eight. There's a whole bunch of different ones. Then the fourth one is crew uh, waste management. Uh, we, as humans, put out a lot of stuff. We pee, we poop. Uh, in our world, we call it you urinate and you fecate, uh, is what it's known as. And uh, so you got to collect, store, process. Uh, for example, we have a program growing right now of how to pull the water out of the out of the feces, out of the poop. Uh, and so you end up with dry poop, but you end up with the water again back in, so you can clean it and yes, drink it later. Um, uh, the fifth one is food management. Uh, so it's it's um, the packaging and the delivery and the processing of food uh, all the way up to where astronauts can eat it. Uh, and then how to deal with the waste. And that is a big thing is, is packages. Packaging is a waste product. Uh, in fact, almost always when a vehicle leaves space station, especially the ones that burn up in the atmosphere, they're chock full of bags of trash. And that trash is a lot of packaging, as a matter of fact. And then finally, uh, once you keep somebody breathing, the next thing they're worried about is what temperature they're at, you know, and, and think of it as a thermostat in your household and, and uh, the fights you have with your spouse on, on whether it's set at 71 or 74 degrees. Uh, we do the systems that maintain that temperature and thermal control all the way from collecting the heat through cold plates, through the heat exchangers and stuff, and then taking it outside of the spacecraft and rejecting it to space through radiators. So when we, we build all of those elements too. So that's life support in, in the totality. All right. So with that, I um, had heard, or I, I can't remember if I heard it or if I read it, um, but there were remarks made that uh, our first mission to Mars would most likely um, be unsuccessful uh, after 67 days because the the amount of humidity would be actually what wound up killing killing the first astronauts to arrive there. And, mm. and I'm wondering if you could comment on that because I see that come up frequently. So a clarification question, that would mean they, they wouldn't survive after six, 67 days of landing on the surface or that the, the 67 days of going to the, to, of traveling there in the first place? I think it was more of a, a colonization um, okay. effort. So it was more, you know, once the boots were on the ground, 67 days, there there was something about uh, the patterns of, of recycling the air uh, becoming such a demand that the, the humidity would wind up drowning um, occupants. <laughs> well, I can pretty much equivocally say because we have technologies that will prevent that. Um, in fact, we build the humidity control system for the CST-100, uh, uh, the, the Starliner project with Boeing, um, their, their human vehicle that's following up the, the Dragon vehicle for taking humans to the space station. So that it's actually easy. The you know the, the Mars is pretty dry, and we have a we have a technology where we can run the cabin air through a, a device uh, that we have that then will reject the the moisture to the outside air. We also can collect that moisture either way. So humidity control is actually one of the quote unquote easier things to do if anything's easy in space. Um, so I'm certainly not worried about them. Uh, um, having an overly humid environment, and, and frankly, you can't drown in a hum overly humid environment, or else everybody in Houston would be dead, right? I mean, if you've ever been to Houston on a hot 90 90% humidity day, that's 90% of the carrying capacity of air. That's what relative humidity means. 
um, if you're at 100% relative humidity, it's raining. So the and you can still breathe that air. How many? Other, no, nobody dies in a rainstorm. So, so no, uh, you won't be able, you won't die because the humidity in the air. That's for sure. And it's actually pretty easy to get rid of. Understood. Um, it's always good to dispel some of the the chatter that you see on social media, and bring it back down to to what can and cannot be done from the expert. Uh, so another question that 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 I this is of personal interest for me because I've I've uh, been a fangirl of Jane Pointer for a long time. Would you mind um, telling us uh, a bit about how Paragon began and who are some of the other people involved in Paragon and um, how the company's grown over over such a, a long time? Okay, yeah, um, yeah. We always joke that we're now a twenty-eight-year-old overnight success. That's uh, uh, that's the uh, one thing. But yeah, no, I I did found the company with uh, five other people. Um, Jane Pointer was one of them. Uh, Tabor McCollum was another. Uh, they were uh, they were actually married after we founded the company, but they were a couple when we founded the company. Um, Dave Bearden, who uh, Jay, uh, Tabor and Dave were both ISU uh, grads, International Space University graduates, and in fact, some of how I met Tabor and then Jane was through ISU because um, it was mentioned during our my ISU days, uh, International Space University schooling, and also I, I back when we did listservs, you know, we didn't have web pages back in those days. I would read the listservs coming out of the biosphere about how things were going on inside. Um, then there was uh, um, Reese Peterson, uh, who I work with him at Lockheed and was a very fantastic financial and management controller. Um, and uh, and then um, Max Nelson uh, was another person who was involved early on, who was also an ISU grad and went on to be uh, he's, he's well. He's extremely uh, strategic think, good, good strategic thinker, and he used to work for I think it was AT and T or Bell Labs. Um, anyway, so so we all got together, and, and as a matter of fact, we kind of started the company not on a product, but on a on a process, on a on an idea. There was a thing that's, that was going to fly any day now called Space Station. Mind you, remember this is 1993, and we recognized that. Jane was a biologist. Tabor was a chemist. I was a straight aerospace techie, as 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 was Dave, and uh, to a lesser extent um, uh, Max. And 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 then of course uh, Reese was, uh, like I say, was also involved in space. Actually, we worked together at Lockheed. Um, anyway, we got together, and it's really realized that if you want to put an experiment on space station that had anything to do with biology, it wasn't good enough to have an aerospace engineer design it because they don't understand the biology and the chemistry but the chemistry and the biologist didn't know the rigor needed and the the analysis needed to do the flight experiments so we melded that together i i had come from lockheed where i was the chief design engineer for the solar race for space station so those big 30 feet wide 108 feet foot tall you know, there's eight of those on space station. Um, uh, those were my babies that I was designing those. So I understood the the design, how to design spaceflight hardware, and also how to design spaceflight hardware that interfaced with people. Because of course, the solar rays were made to be uh, made and maintained and repaired by the astronauts. So we had to know all that. And then it, again, we, we joked that it was actually we were the translator between the people in. Birkenstocks and a lab coat versus the people with pen protectors, you know, is that the, the, they, they have different languages, different ways of working, and we worked in the nexus between that. On the other side of it also, it's just that life support has always been um, very attractive to me because it's a very cross-disciplinary thing. I'm, I'm, a, I am, my, my degrees are in mechanical engineering and then masters in aeronautics and astronautics, very techie stuff. Um, but I've always been interested in the human element and the, and the human, not only the human element of what we, the chemical and stuff, but also the psychological element, how you design a product that a human will use, and in this case in space, and how it, 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 the, that sort of fundamental things are, are really exciting. And so that's, that's one thing exciting about Paragon is, is, you know, somebody asked me just yesterday, what's your ideal candidate for a, for a position at Paragon? And I said, well, somebody who knows a lot about everything. Because, <laughs> you, you know, it, it's, uh, and it's not really true. I mean, we're to almost 200 people. And so, yes, we have very specialized chemists. We have specialized design engineers. We have specialist analyst engineers. 
but they have to we have to have all of those disciplines uh to uh, to really be able to do our job it's it's uh it's not easy designing with humans in the loop i'll tell you that <laughs> so, so with that I, I guess i'm curious what was the path what was the roadmap to being able to work with nasa and and, and building the things that that you're now currently involved in and going from that startup all those years ago because before you there really wasn't anything out there like you yeah i mean you, you had to earn your chops i mean there were definitely companies that did life support because of course people went on apollo to the moon and the space shuttle was built and, and for that matter the space station um so there's de there's definitely companies that um uh that specialized in it that had grown up from the the aircraft world because the aircraft you do have to worry about certain parts pressurization humidification of air it's usually your the air is too dry not too wet up on the on aircraft so there were companies like allied signal honeywell and stuff that had done that um but yeah we were much more focused on it and only that um how you start working with nasa um definitely there's there's different ways with the, the small business innovative research is is great that's a program that's been going on since the 80s we did i think we did our first sbir in the late 90s um but it's also uh, we we flew our first products on the space station in 1996 so it, was, it took about three years to actually get our first flight experiment on the space on the space shuttle um and that took a little bit of being at the right place at the right time looking knowing what we're looking for being focused and then um frankly it's, uh, the bioserve out of out of colorado uh, had a contract with NASA to build a a isothermal chamber that would keep biological experiments at the right temperature, and they were frankly looking for things to put in it. You know, they were given the contract because we weren't there yet. We didn't we didn't have the chops to to do that at that time, um, and so they came to us and said, "Hey, you guys know more about the." how to contain biology. And they had seen a demonstration of some of our, we have a patent on something called the ABS, the Autonomous Biological System, where uh, we can make aquatic animals and plants live in harmony, essentially, and cycle back and forth, but it's a fully enclosed life support system for aquatic animals and plants. And they said, we, we got to fly this. So so they contacted us. We work with them. So you, we, we literally, they, uh, they I think, told us, um, in November, they wanted to do that, and we were on a we were watching the takeoff on the shuttle. And by May of that next year, uh, that came down. That was the proof in the pudding experiment. And then three months later, we went up to the uh, Mir space station, and we got put on the Mir space station for three months and brought back down. And then that one didn't have a camera, so there was a lot of thing questions about what went on. We were able to analyze the samples and stuff. So they said, hey, can you put a camera on this? So we integrated a camera and, in fact, flew the first DVR digital camera ever on the space shuttle. Um, and, uh, and we bought that camera at, at Fry's Electronics in California and stripped off everything that would outgas, gave it to Marshall to show that it was out, not outgas, and then actually um, work with Sony to reprogram the EEPROM so that it would come on and turn off and stay at the same settings, whereas the, the commercial version, you turn it on, it always reset itself to a certain setting. Um, and they also, uh, Sony did a great thing. They gave us 10 tapes, 90 minutes each, and they verified every single bit on the tapes. There was not one single bad bit on the whole 90 minute tape. Um, they actually had a Shinto blessing when they sent them to it from Japan too. Uh, it, was, it was quite interesting, but so, so it takes diligence. It takes uh, concentration on details. It takes a little bit of luck maybe. Um, and, and the desire, the, the focus, you know, you, you want to set out to do something. Anybody who starts a company knows that you've got to keep, keep the goal in mind and don't say no, take no for an answer. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I, I am wanting to, cause I've never got to ask you this in our conversations before, but what was that first launch like? Oh man, I, that was fantastic. Um, we actually were uh let's see that that flight where was i well we were at banana river which is the nearest you can be you're actually on the bleachers next to the astronaut families uh so you're three miles away and that thing took off and because it was an or that was an orbital experiment so it took off and went straight east and uh 
it was quite amazing. Uh, for one thing, I, I remember, and I hope I'm not mixing up my launches because I've seen a few, but um, it was at dawn and the light, the, the sun was, the, the, the sky was light, but the sun wasn't up yet. Mind you, we're on the East Coast, of course, so where you're looking east towards the rocket. So you're, luckily the sun wasn't up, you wouldn't be able to see the rocket. But the very interesting thing was there was no stars out because it was that light, you know, post 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 dusk or post dawn. And the rocket went up and the smoke trail made a um, made a shadow and it was like a laser beam that went across the sky. And even though you could see no stars right up the middle in this laser beam of dark, you could see the stars. It was really, really cool. But the other thing is just the visceral feeling. You know, you're three miles away. You see the thing light up and start taking off. You start cheering, and then the sound hits you, and it's it is a crackling rumble. It's it's enough at three miles to make your shirt move a little bit, and you can feel it in your chest. It 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 resonates in your chest cavity, and I, I guarantee it'll bring tears to the the most the most unemotional person around. Uh, it, it's it's not just the emotion that you let go from all the work and that your work is finally going up on space station on the space shuttle, but it's also just an emotional, wow, what can we do as a human species and and how are we harnessing that much energy and directing it and and thrusting that six million pound vehicle up into space? It, it's uh, it, it's indescribable. I tell everybody, it doesn't matter if you've gone to IMAX movies and you've watched it, if you ever get a chance to watch a live launch. Uh, the last one I launched was in, uh, last launch I went to was in February of a Cygnus vehicle that was taking our BPA up to space station. Every single one of them has an emotional element to it and uh, no two are the same. So I know I've seen at least three shuttle launches uh, live with hardware on them. And I've also been to Balkanor, so I've actually watched a Soyuz take off too. So I've, I've had the experiences in a few different places. And it's, it's uh, if you've ever get a chance to watch a rocket launch live, go do it. Don't, don't, don't wait, don't wait for the movie. I, I would really hope that it doesn't come down to being a bucket list, but yes, I understand. <laughs> Something I definitely want to be there for. Well, another, another aspect of, of all of this is I know that, that you've got, a lot going on right now, um, some SBIRs with NASA, uh, some things like that. How does Paragon pave the way to uh, longer missions, farther journeys, uh, making colonization um, or settlement uh, more of a reality, um, more tangible, more permanent? Well, um, and you mentioned the SBIR programs. That's one thing we do is, you know, NASA is looking out for this technology, looking forward in this technology, and we're constantly thinking about what technology we can just slightly adapt for longer missions uh, or what is already ready for longer missions, which are very few, as a matter of fact. I often say the long pole in the tent of going to Mars is the life support system. We know how to do everything else. We, we know how to navigate there. We know rockets. We know how to land although not necessarily as much mass as we need to for a habitat, but we've never proven a life support system that far away for that long. And a lot of people say, well, the space station has been flying for 20 years. Well, yeah, but the space station is, is 30 minutes away from escape if something badly goes wrong. If there's something that goes wrong, they're a month, two, maybe three months away for a launch for replacement goods. And they've had to replace things. I don't think that any part of the life, a different part of the life system fails about every three to nine months, depending on what it is. And of course, going to Mars and back is a two or three year mission. So right now we don't have an existence proof of a system of life support that can take you all over Mars and back. Recycling the water, we've talked about that we have a system that will take, recycle 98% of the water. So that's pretty good. That cuts you down on the amount of water you have to bring in tanks. Um, recycling the air, Recycling the oxygen is a hard one. You know, how do you get the oxygen out of CO2? So we've worked on solid oxide electrolysis, which is the ability, just like in high school, you used to stick two wires in some water and you get hydrogen and oxygen. It's a lot tougher with CO2. It's a lot stronger bond, but you can essentially put a, an electrical field across a ceramic disc then, and pull the carbon. You actually pull one oxygen model mo molecule off of carbon dioxide to make carbon monoxide and oxygen. 
they recombine and make an O2 molecule, which is what you breathe. And then you can actually run the carbon monoxide through a cracker is what it's known as. And it actually then separates the oxygen and carbon and you end up with carbon dust, which is a problem. Where do you, how do you do recycle that? It's very inert stuff in a way. And then you end up with the other oxygen. So you, can, so that's the oxygen side. Um, and then just making sure that everything lasts, the pumps and everything else. One of the things, the philosophies that have to change with long duration life support is we tend to d design things in what we call ORUs, orbital replacement units. So for example, the space station solar arrays that I designed had three orbital plate replacement units, the left blanket box, the right blanket box, and the center mass canister. Theoretically, you could also replace the motor on it if you had to, or you, for that matter, you could manually uh, uh, extend it and retract it with a hand tool. But each one of those RUs was 1,400 pounds almost. Um, and on the space station, say a pump package is an ORU. So if a pump in the uh, water coolant circulation system dies, you take out the old pump, you put in a new pump, and you send the old pump back to Earth to find out why it failed. You're going to Mars, you can't do that. You can't take eight pumps with you or how many other pumps you need. The, the orbital replacement unit has to be the gasket. It has to be the bearing. It has to be the resistor that failed in your motor control system, the, the Hollis effect device or something. So you have to be able to make these systems so you can maintain them on the way there and back with smaller parts so you don't bury yourselves in, in spare parts that you fly with. Um, very often we hear about 3D printing. The problem with that is 3D printing complex objects. You can't 3D print a resistor right now that I know of. Um, and even also then is that every engineer optimizes the material for the job. So a piston on a pump um, is a different type of aluminum than the housing. And so if you have a crack in the housing, how do you repair it? With the 3D printing, you can't really right now combine elements to make 6061 aluminum or 775, which are just different differences in the elements inside in the heat treating. Um, and so you've got to think from the beginning of designing your spacecraft, what materials am I going to use in order to make 3D printing viable? Um, so that's another element of it. Food, whether you take food, I, I will tell you now that you won't grow food on the way to Mars. Uh, there's nothing, by the time you have a hydroponic or, hyd or aerophonic system or whatever else, or maybe just plant uh, growth chambers, um, by the time you have all the elements that do that, and how they will fail and the spare parts you need for them and the power needed to do that. A plant will never produce food in a zero gravity environment, at least, um, efficiently enough to replace the life support system. And oh, by the way, you have a radiation event that kills all your plants. You're gonna have to have a, a, what we call a physiochemical system anyway. So now since you have the physiochemical system there, you know, plants don't make sense. When you get to the surface of Mars, it makes more sense, however, Remember, Mars has two or three month long uh, um, uh, sandstorms that will, dust storms that will blot out the sun, really make it, you can't red grow anything. So, so uh, you're going to have to have a power system that can supply the power. And so I, I contend that you won't have a viable biological life support system be growing food on Mars until you have a medium sized nuclear reactor you can plump down on Mars that will produce power. Um, and then, uh, and then the one thing we haven't touched on is is both the moon and Mars, very different environments. And in fact, very people often say you can learn things from moon you can take to Mars. You can also learn the wrong things at the moon that you take to Mars and find out they still don't work, uh, or they work in a different way. And that's moon dust and and Mars dust. Uh, two sound like they're the same. They're both called dust. They're extremely different. What you design to mitigate the dust on the lunar surface is not perhaps what will work on the Martian surface or vice versa. Paragon has a contract right now. Um, I believe we signed it. I know we've won it, but we're still in negotiation. I think we may have actually signed it today. And that is for removing dust from radiator surfaces on the moon. Uh, and how do you do that? Um, so there's all sorts of elements. So we're working all those little things to get us to, to, to Mars. It's a, it's not a slam dunk. It's not a, oh yeah, we're ready to go tomorrow. Which brings up one last point I will say about that is you can't hurry up those tests of a life support system. 
life support systems fail because of biological growth in the filters are are a corrosion um, of due to a chemical imbalance in the in the coolant system or something those things don't happen fast and there's no way to really accelerate the testing on them you just you have to do it right um, and uh, and so if you want to be flying to Mars with a life support system you know will work you need to have built it now and be testing it almost you know to get two or three years of testing on your belt oh and by the way testing on the ground does not necessarily mean it'll work in zero gravity and microgravity in space um one nasa report i saw attributed 80 percent of the failures of the life support system were due to zero gravity effects that you never would have discovered on the ground test so there's a good this is why we, we love the HALO program and, and it's very necessary. It is really a stepping stone to get to Mars because you need to put a life support system and put it on in a place far away so you can't just keep repairing it all the time um, and, and test it long duration. And that's what one of the things HALO will be doing as well as providing this way station. It will be the place to test out the technologies for going to Mars. Um, and and you got to do that and yes we've been doing a lot of tests on the space station we have a lot of knowledge from what the space station but like i say you have to redesign it and because an oru the oru concept they were designed to be replaced in chunks um and 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 uh, i will say that that the 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 just because you've built something and it works once uh, for example, there was a subsystem. I won't name the subsystem on space station. They built one. The first one got up there, lasted 10 and a half years or something like that. Well, it then started, started to show that it was going to fail. So NASA turned to the same supplier, said, build me another one of these. They built it to exactly the same drawings. It got up on space station and lasted three months and crapped out. So some of the same design lasted 10 years and then three months. And so uh, there's a lot of subtleties involved. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So how do you light the candle and head to Mars confidently, knowing that everything's going to work? You don't. You have to have confidence that you're going to be able to fix anything that goes wrong because something will go wrong. Um, and be very smart about the design up front so that you can fix things. And that's, that's what's going to get you to Mars and back. So... Um now, Paragon has more than one location. Isn't that a, a fairly new development? Mm -hmm. Yeah, our headquarters is in Tucson, Arizona. It always has been here. Uh, actually, when I was uh, starting the company with my friends, um, I was living actually in San Jose, California, because I was working for Lockheed and Sunnyvale, where we built the Solar Racer Space Station. And uh, But I didn't want to live in California. It was getting crowded, way too expensive. My wife's my first starter home cost, you know, $250,000 for 900 square feet, you know. So um, we, we decided to start here. Also, Jane and Tabor were here. Uh, and it just made a lot of sense um, for us and us as a family, as well as uh, as well as us as a economic concern. I mean, I'll admit, you know, some uh, uh, an office, you know, an administrative assistant in Tucson is a lot cheaper than an administrative assistant in San Jose, California, or was at that point. And I assume it still is. Um, so Tucson is our, our main headquarters, and we have actually two locations even in Tucson. We have one building that is um, where we do all of our manufacturing test and quality control and stuff for manufacturing. And then we have another, head, what's the real head, the headquarters building where the executives are and everything else, although we, we're only a mile apart, so we, we can get over to the hardware wherever we want. Plus, also, we have a lot of hot seats in the other place, what we call the Michigan Street location, so that if an engineer has hardware going through the shop, they can be right there to fix things and help with stuff right away. Then we have a location in Denver in the Lakewood area um, where we have about 30-some employees. And then we also have an office um, just outside of NASA, jo Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas also. And it's, uh, it's also 25, 30 employees. So you're definitely growing right now. Yeah, we we are. Well, we're we're at we're at. Um, I think the official count when I looked at it a few days ago was 182 people, um, and uh, we are growing, and uh, and also making sure that the you know there's as as programs to go through different stages. We want to make sure that 
you know, eventually something's designed and you're in test and stuff and you don't need quite so many engineers. So they've got to go on to the next program. So, so yeah, we've got the next programs coming down and, and uh, we're not as growing as fast as we were last year. Last year we were, we were sometimes hiring uh, 20 people a month. Um, but, uh, because of, um, of different programs, not just the Halo program, but other programs too. HLS was one of them, of course, that we were on the Dianetics team and that's still in protest. I know I got an email today about that. So we'll see, we'll see what happens with that program. All right. Well, but everybody wants to go space. I mean, we're, we're every single commercial space station that I know of has, has approached us also to, and is talking to us, or we have contracts to do parts of their, if not all, but parts of their life support system. All right, well, thank you so very much for spending the afternoon with us today. I enjoy it, Ron. Every time I talk to you, it's a lot of fun. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Grant. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for visiting with us at Space Matters. For anyone who has any questions about Paragon Space Development Corporation, please reach out to us and we can field those questions. Additionally, if you haven't made plans for the summer yet, look into Janet's Planet for summer camp. We'll see you next time.